Sweet merciful crap, it's hot in this thing. Can we not do this anymore? <laughs> oh, by the way, this is our Halloween episode. My recommendation for a new release this week is Deborah Granick's Winter's Bone, based on the novel by Daniel Woodrell, which won the Grand Jury Prize and Best Screenplay Award at the 2010 Sundance Film Festival. Winter's Bone is set in the Ozarks and follows 17-year-old Reed Dolly, played by Jennifer Lawrence, who must track down her crystal meth cooking fugitive father, who is due for court, missing, and has put up their house as his bail bond. Now, Winter's Bone is very much sort of that quintessential Sundance film. It's that low-budget American slice-of-life film that follows characters in a setting that, you know, we on, you know, East Coast urban dwellers are very unfamiliar with. It's very much in the vein of former Sundance films. Frozen River, directed by Courtney Hunt, which is another Grand Jury Prize winner, and mm -hmm. Ballast by Lance Hammer, who probably has the best superhero name you could possibly think of, and he's not even a superhero. Or a porn star name. Or a porn star name. Woodrow described the story as country noir. Mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? Yeah, it, it's really cool. It's kind of like a, a blending of genres, almost in the same vein as like a Coen Brothers film. If you would have taken the plot for Winter's Bone and kind of set it in the 1950s in New York City, this would have been a, a hard-boiled detective story, like down to the core. Wow. But because he sets it in this kind of backwater area and has these countryish characters, it adds a completely different spin to that idea of what we know as like a noir film, and it's really engaging and it's really kind of awesome to see it. Oh, wow. Now, Jim, as you know, I'm a huge fan of the Bill Engvall show. Yeah. And Jennifer Lawrence, who appears in this movie, was in that show. Yeah. Inquiring minds want to know, <laughs> how is Jennifer Lawrence? Right. First thing, may God have mercy on your soul. Second thing, Jennifer Lawrence is fantastic. She is the core of this film. She's in every single scene. Uh, for a young actor, she shows great poise and great emotional uh, intensity and maturity in this. Uh, and, but even saying that, uh, really the guy who steals the show in pretty much every scene is John Hawks, who plays... Uh, her uncle, Teardrop. Uh, John Hawks is a proven character actor. He's been working for years. So not only is he a great emotional core, but he also acts as a guide, uh, not only for Reed Dolly, but also for us as the audience, guiding us through the seedy underbelly of this drug subculture that we would have no idea about otherwise. Speaking of drug culture, that's a perfect transition into my pick for section two, oh. What the Bleep Is This? <laughs> <laughs> A Scanner Darkly is a paranoid science fiction take on drug trafficking. Directed by Richard Linklater, based on the novel by Philip K. Dick, it stars Keanu Reeves as an undercover DEA agent, Woody Harrelson and Robert Downey Jr. as his stoner buddies, and Winona Ryder as his mysterious dealer slash love interest. Equally funny as it is gravely serious, Linklater spins a complex mystery that dives into the psychosis of a futuristic narc. And the kicker? It's animated. Yes, and not to be confused with last week's pick of How to Train Your Dragon, this is not Disney, Pixar, DreamWorks animation, this is rotoscoping. Yes, rotoscoping. Uh, it's a rarely used process mm -hmm. in which a movie or a commercial or a TV, whatever, film property is shot in the real world mm -hmm. with live cameras and then each frame is animated and drawn over. And uh, it, it seems like at first that in a scanner directly this idea of rotoscoping might kind of get gimmicky after the first 15-20 minutes. But it really doesn't. It really adds an extra an extra dimension uh, to this story that Philip K. Dick and Richard Linklater were trying to tell. It works in perfect tandem. Yeah. It sets up this very surreal, fantasy-like world, and there are certain things to having to do with drug trips and dreaming and perception versus reality. Yeah, certainly. And credit Richard Linklater as a director for taking this the surreal and dreamlike visual quality and these equally dark and humorous material. Uh, and having that actually enhance and accentuate the social commentary that Philip K. Dick was trying to slip into the story. Absolutely. They do a lot of social commentary. The whole grander uh, message of the film is deep within it, mm -hmm. especially um, at the end with, yeah. with the climactic ending. Yeah. Uh, but also, the film um, has a credit sequence mm -hmm. where they include um, Philip K. Dick's original dedication of the book, right. which was to all of the uh, friends and family he had that were affected by drugs. And we'd be remiss, I think, if we didn't just mention also at points how funny this film can be. I mean, Robert yeah. Downey Jr. and Woody Harrelson are just a great combination in every scene they're in. Yeah, there's an excellent scene where uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s character thinks that someone 
stole the gears from his bike. <laughs> it's a very funny scene. Yeah. But let's get away from sad and depressing things that can kill us and transition into section three where we'll be talking about a lot more enjoyable and gruesome things that can kill us and for your consideration. <laughs> So we are on the home stretch for Halloween, and as you can see, uh, what you're going to queue is ready for tricks and or treats, depending on the availability of each. Uh, and so we thought this week would only be apropos to have our favorite horror films as this week's theme. Uh, and we hope that you take our recommendations to heart so that you don't spend your hard-earned money on seeing Saw 3D or waste valuable Netflix queue space on watching the abysmal Hellraiser series. No more games. What do you have against the Hellraiser series? What do you have against good movies? And speaking of good movies, my recommendation is going to be Session 9, directed by Brad Anderson, starring Peter Milan, Josh Lucas, and David Caruso. Session 9 follows a hazmat crew sent to clean up an abandoned mental institution in a short period of time. Tensions within the crew begin to rise as everybody brings their own inner demons into a building with a horrific past that seems to be coming back. And the really interesting part of this film is uh, how each and every character brings their own inner turmoil to this situation. Uh, you know, you have Peter Milan's character, who's kind of the lead, um, really struggling for work. He really needed this job real bad, and he's, you know, suffering fatigue and a little bit of depression after the birth of his son. You have David Caruso's character, whose girlfriend recently left him for Josh Lucas's character, and they have to work together. Uh-oh. And it's just everyone brings their own problems to the table. Every aspect of this film, from the art direction to the set design to the cinematography to this really creepy fictional backstory of this place, just adds to this tension and this building sense of suspense. And because it's a film that's very much based around what you don't see, it really allows your imagination to fill in the gaps in between what's happening between these people and what's happening between them and this, you know, institution. Now, uh, this is a tonal shift from Brad Anderson's earlier work. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't really understand it either because Brad Anderson in his early career was doing very lighthearted and, you know, kind of romantic works with, you know, The Darien Gap and Next Stop Wonderland. Then all of a sudden there was this weird dark tonal shift. I don't know if his puppy got run over or somebody close to him got murdered by a serial killer. <laughs> but all of a sudden his, his work started focusing on these dark brooding stories. You have this and you have Trans-Siberian and The Machinist and a lot of horror work that he's done for TV. And I don't really know where it comes from, but I'm happy it did. Because he really focuses on these stories with these dark psychological inner turmoils. He's not concerned with monsters. He's not really concerned with gore. He's not really concerned with jump scares. He just really likes the idea of a bunch of people who have their own psychoses coming together and just seeing how that situation can explode. Well, Brad Anderson may not be concerned with monsters, but Frank Darabont surely is. Oh. My pick for our Halloween theme week is The Mist, yes. directed by Frank Darabont, based on the short story by Stephen King. It stars Thomas Jane, Marsha Gay Harden, and Andre Brower. A deep fog rolls into town, stranding a father, his son, and a small band of citizens in their local supermarket. But little do they know, the horror is about to emerge from the mist. Frank Darabont, great director. He's adapted plenty of Stephen King stuff before, but this is the first time that he actually dwells with genre, specifically the horror genre, Yeah, and it's fantastic. I Absolutely. I mean, it's wonderful to see that he can also take on some of his Stephen King's meteor, more scary, intense uh, stories. Yeah, and Frank Darabont certainly adds his own take to this film. He wanted it to be an homage to those 1950s B-horror films that he was watching when he was a kid. Mm -hmm. Wanted to shoot it in black and white. The studio wouldn't let him. So the theatrical cut is in color. If you purchase the DVD, this, this two-disc edition DVD, you can actually watch the black and white cut on that one, so I highly recommend you go out and buy that. But it's really cool how he takes what's real, what was really good about those 1950s horror films and adds that commentary angle to it. This does what the best horror films do, and that while there are, yes, real monsters, external monsters, creatures coming to attack these people, sure. It exposes the demons within ourselves yeah. and that the scariest parts of this movie are the interactions between this Lord of the Flies-esque band of people stuck in the supermarket. Yeah, that really, the, the scariest films are always one that add that horrific element of things that could actually happen. Mm -hmm. And in the mist, that's on full display because you have this outside conflict of these otherworldly creatures and inside you have this group of characters that should be uniting against a common foe and they're dividing amongst themselves. Mm. And that is the most terrifying aspect, that these people are turning on each other 
when they should be coming together. Absolutely. The Mist takes a very stark outlook mm -hmm. on human nature, yeah. especially in the ending. Yeah. Uh, I recently got a chance to hear Frank Dar Darabont speak at uh, New York Comic Con, okay. and one fan in the crowd said regarding the ending of this film, that took balls. <laughs> it certainly does. And uh, uh, I personally love that ending. I know I've had conversations with people before that don't see it as a logical extension of the cynicism of human society. They see it as not to spoil it for anybody, but this unmotivated do es machina, and I think that's foolish. It's such a thought-provoking, challenging ending, mm -hmm. but it's so awesome. Well, Ax and I are agreeance. If you think that the ending of The Mist is unmotivated do es machina, I think it's safe to say you can throw yourself down the stairs. <laughs> uh, this is our most violent episode yet. <laughs> well, and fittingly, yeah. and speaking of things that cause violent outrage, uh, we have reached the end of episode four of What You're Gonna Cue. But to assuage that anger, keep in mind you still have one more chance to win a free DVD. Oh. And for November, we will be running a new contest, so keep an eye on the blog for information about that. Once again, guys, thanks for watching. You can reach us by email and all of our relevant social media outlets. And I hope that everybody out there has a happy Halloween and stays very safe if you are going to go out trick-or-treating. I've been trick-or-treated to death tonight. You don't know what death is. Tweet now.